This is the podcast for the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. I'm Cynthia Graber. Loneliness is a subjective experience, but neuroscientists define it as a distress that arrives from a discrepancy between perceived and desired social relationships. There may be an evolutionary benefit to the feeling of loneliness. We're a social species, and feeling lonely might have sent us to seek out other humans, which has been very important for survival. However, it does seem like there is a point where this warning bell, this alarm bell actually takes a turn for the worse, and it tends to propagate itself where people feel lonely, they feel socially excluded, and then they withdraw socially. So it just sort of perpetuates and propagates that, um, that cycle. And then the loneliness gets worse, the isolation gets worse, and often people have negative health side effects from that as well. Ellen Lee is assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Lee, what are those health effects? So the health effects of loneliness um, have been shown to double mortality rates, it's linked to cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease. Um, loneliness has been linked to cognitive decline and higher rates of dementia. And then, of course, loneliness is linked to poor mental health outcomes like depression and anxiety. With loneliness implicated in so many cognitive impacts, Dr. Lee and her colleagues wanted to understand what is known to date about the impact of loneliness on the brain. They conducted a systematic review of the published research that examines loneliness and resulting neurobiological assessments, such as imaging studies, EEG studies, and pathological studies. The results are published in the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. So what were the results of this literature review? What did you find? Our findings show that there's a lot of areas of the brain that are actually different either in size or in connectivity or in activation um, when you're lonely compared to non-lonely individuals. Um, one of the areas was the prefrontal cortex, and that wasn't surprising in many ways because it's so involved in emotional regulation and in inhibitory control. It's also involved in executive functioning and self-referential processes, so like understanding yourself in relationship to other people. We also found that loneliness was linked to areas, other areas of the brain regarding emotion. So for example, the amygdala, which is involved in fear detection and emotional processing, as well as the insula, were common areas that were highlighted in some of the papers that we found. Interestingly, we also found a few studies that show that the ventral striatum, which is important for reward processing, reward and reinforcement was another area that was important in loneliness. And a recently published study, which could not be included in our review, showed that there was some activation in the substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area um, for among young adults who were actually being socially isolated. Did anything in the results surprise you? In some ways, um, one of the things that was surprising for us was that the attentional networks was actually in a, a consistent area that was pinged in loneliness. And I think part of that was linked to these early theories about hypervigilance and how um, vigilance for social threats may be driving loneliness. And it was interesting to see that link play out in the review. Another one was that we found loneliness to be consistently associated with uh, biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, like amyloid and tau. While these weren't 100% consistent, it made you wonder about how loneliness could actually be involved in the early pathophysiology of cognitive decline. What do the results of the paper mean to you? What's going on in the brains of the people who are experiencing loneliness? The interesting thing about the effects of loneliness on the brain is that it doesn't seem to affect just one area of the brain or even one circuit. It seems like it, it may start from potentially the emotional processing regions, but it really affects the entire brain, especially the cortex. And I think this is going to be important because when we try to intervene on loneliness, it's not going to be a simple, you know, stimulation of a very specific area of the brain. So let's talk about the interventions. It would seem to me that to be less lonely, an intervention would be a social one. How do pharmacological interventions fit in? So one key note is that there are loneliness interventions that just increase socialization, just increase social activities, time spent in the company of other people, and it doesn't work consistently where that helps loneliness. So one thought is if the triggering cause for loneliness is not just lack of social contacts or frequency of socializing, then maybe there is some other upstream cause to the loneliness, like either a disruption in the social reward pathway, so you don't get as much pleasure out of social interactions, or there is a sort of hypervigilance where you are more sensitive to social threats, or there are these negative social cognitions that are affecting how you perceive relationships. 
So one thought is that there are specific drugs that are that may help with affiliation with other people. Like we know that oxytocin, for example, is really important in how we bond with other people, how we you know, respond to close relationships. So that was one thought where in certain conditions with built-in social cognitive deficits like schizophrenia or autism, where medications like oxytocin could play a role. This is, of course, very early stages, but it is an area of interest of ours to understand why certain people are lonely with the same amount of socialization as someone else. Um, there have been some studies that show that social network size does not always relate to feeling lonely. So social isolation and loneliness are connected, but they're disparate concepts. They can be overlapping, but they each play their own role on health effects and, and functioning. Now that you have an understanding of the state of research, where does the research on loneliness need to go next? Yeah, I think in terms of next steps, we do need to more deeply phenotype people for this study. Um, for example, understanding the effects of aging and loneliness on the brain um, is one important step. I agree that we need larger studies, but I think we also need to be more targeted. And that's where I think intervention studies are really key. And that's one thing that hasn't happened yet, where people are connecting interventions to actually assess the changes on the brain afterward. And that's something we would like to see, because otherwise it's difficult to know if this is the cause or the effect of loneliness on the brain. The other thing that um, is important is that loneliness is a subjective construct, but we are aware that there are key behaviors that are linked to loneliness, like disruptions in sleep, disruptions in how often you interact with other people, maybe even life space, how often you travel mm -hmm. outside of a certain area. And I think trying to come up with more multimodal measures of loneliness, I think will be important. Even with a single item question of how often you feel lonely, you'll see biases where men are less likely to report feeling lonely, whereas women are more likely to report feeling lonely with those measures. If you have a list of questions about loneliness, like the UCLA loneliness scale, it doesn't actually explicitly use, explicitly use the word lonely. You'll see equal numbers of loneliness between the genders. What's your major takeaway from the review? I guess this study showed us that there is some exciting preliminary evidence that there are consistent neurobiological findings that are correlated with loneliness. I think it also opened up our eyes to some of the different possible mechanisms of interest to target in loneliness. It also brought our attention to the idea that certain interventions may actually affect how our brain functions. And it can also show how loneliness is linked to some of these downstream cognitive effects that we've seen. So if anything, it sort of laid the groundwork for a lot of new projects that we want to pursue and want to start um, looking into. This is the podcast for the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. To read the paper discussed in the podcast, go to www.nature.com slash NPP. I'm Cynthia Graber.